your Bibles, meet me in Jeremiah, the 29th chapter, Jeremiah 29, 12, Jeremiah 29, 12, Jeremiah 29, 12, and when you get there, say something, not there yet, say hold up, wait a minute. You could always tell those of us who have a testimony. I love it. <laughs> you, you never quite lose it all the way. And, you know, the homies still clap like this. They're saved, but, you know, I love it. <laughs> um, Jeremiah 29, 12. The, the word of the Lord through Jeremiah comes to the people who have given ear to false prophets who had told them that they were coming out of their Babylonian captivity or as Babylonian exiles that we returned to Jerusalem in a short period of time. Jeremiah says that that's not what the Lord says. He says you'll be here 70 years. So he tells them to start setting up shop in Babylon a while because uh, the Lord is going to keep them there for 70 years. They won't come out for 70 years. and that, That's the heart of it. But I want to lift a verse out of this passage that I believe is fitting and finds many of us where we are. And it reads, Jeremiah 29th chapter, beginning at the 12th verse. Then when you call upon me, and come and pray to me, I will hear you. When you search for me, you will find me. If you seek me with all of your heart. Before you take your seats, look at a few people. Tell them, seek him, seek him, seek him, seek him, seek him, seek him. I want to ask a question that may be too rudimentary for you seasoned saints. It's a question that I actually wrestled with after being in ministry. You may know this, but please um, just indulge me if this is too basic of a question for you. Um, when I read this passage, the first question that comes to mind out of all the other promises that God makes is why does it seem at times as if God withdraws? Okay. All right. Why? I know there's some of you that carry an overwhelming sense of the presence in the glory of God. You wake up with a tongue in your mouth. And not this one, I mean, a hundarabo shaha. You, you wake up full of glory and anointing. Uh, but I came today not for you. came for a few people that have, that, that have asked the question, that have wondered, why does it seem at times like God withdraws a sense of 
his presence or his attributes in my life. Uh, I realize that we're in church and there's, there, there's a lot of, what I learned about church is there's a lot of peer pressure in church. You got to look like you're the one that's got it together. That, that, that you're not the one that wrestles and questions and is frustrated. But I'm going to break the uh, anonymity by polling you. As opposed to making a comment, let me do it in the form of a question. Has anyone ever asked or wondered why it seems as if God withdraws a sense of his presence by a show of hands? Okay, all right, okay, okay, all right, all right. We got some real saints in the house that never wrestle with that, but it's all good. While its promise in this passage was originally spoken to Israel, it reveals something of the nature, if you're taking notes, of God's interaction with humankind. We, we realize, I, I realize, biblically looking at this, that this was a promise that was extended, a conversation that was in the context of the children of Israel who, again, were in Babylonian captivity or in Babylonian exile. And God promises them after 70 years, you're going to come out of this place, you'll be restored to Jerusalem, and the glory will be there. We'll once again uh, be in a glorious place. Now, while God's word to us is not that we're coming out of exile, that we'll once again be in a glorious place. There is, again, a principle of the nature of God as it relates to his interaction with his people or humankind that can be extracted from this text. While not in Babylonian exile, many in this place are captive to complacency in your walk with God. Or you become captive to discouragement in your walk with God. This wasn't even my message today, but the Holy Spirit shifted gears last night at 11 o'clock p.m. <laughs> Don't you wonder sometimes why God does not give inspiration early? <laughs> why he chooses to speak his utterances in the midnight hour. I, 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 I sure wish I could have got better sleep. I didn't go to bed until two or three uh, to get ready for this morning service, but I, I think it'll be worth it. The, uh, the, the question is, to those who have found themselves in complacency in your walk with God or just outright discouraged, why does it seem as if, particularly when we need it, when we're looking for it, that God withdraws a sense of his presence, or that your encounter with him becomes a little bit stale. Now, sometimes it's on our part. There are things that we need to employ, but can we just keep it real for a second? There are times that I am doing what I'm supposed to do, and the challenge with many of our Christian circles is we do not give nuanced answers to the nuanced challenges that people face in this life. The Bible actually has nuanced answers to specific challenges that we face in this life. Yet, no matter what anyone goes through in this life, no matter what someone's facing, our two answers are just pray a little bit more and read a little bit more of your Bible. Now, I understand that, and please hear me, I understand the, the supremacy of God's word. I understand that his word is a lamp unto our feet, his uh, light unto our path. I understand prayer is our communication with God and that he's given us the keys of the kingdom. We are a spirit filled church and I believe that uh, whatsoever things we bind on earth are bound in heaven whatsoever things we loose on earth are loose in heaven I believe that there's a partnership in between our declaration on earth and the resource of heaven but even with knowing that those two things are in my arsenal there are times in life where I've read my word I'm reading my word and I'm praying to God but the reality is I just don't feel an overwhelming sense of his presence I become frustrated in my journey in my walk with God there are things that discourage me and I and I have to to ask myself the question, God, why aren't you as prominent as you once were? Why am I not as moved as I once was? I'm doing the same thing, doing the same routine. Somebody came to church and you said, I just, I don't know why I came here. I just, my feet led me here, but I'm, I'm not even expecting anything because the last few times I've been, it hadn't hit. It may be going on around me and that's great, uh, but, but it's not hitting me like it's hitting everybody else. And so uh, I don't think we give enough room to talk about those 
those issues we face. Uh, and you don't want to just hear, just go read a little bit more and just go say a couple prayers. You, you need to know about this encounter that we have with God when we feel like a sense. We know better. We're not crazy. We know that God will not leave us or forsake us. But ah, I'm not talking about that. We know that God is everywhere at once. We know that the presence of the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of us. But the reality is, even with the, our bodies being the temple of the Holy Spirit, there are times in our life where it doesn't feel like our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't feel like the glory is flowing through us. It doesn't feel like there's an overwhelming sense of God's presence. And I didn't come to talk to the super saints today. I just came to talk to a handful of people that will be real in this place that say, I, from time to time, I have to throw my hands up and say, God, what's up with that? Am I, am I in the right place? Good, 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 good. Because uh, I thought it was just for me. I, I'm not going to lie. I'm pre a preacher. I've been preaching for a long time. I have to stand up here and encourage you every single Sunday. Y'all don't, don't even care about what's going on in my life. Y'all don't care. You better have a word. And if you miss one week, we may give you another week. But if you bomb two weeks straight, I'm going to be visiting. Y'all don't care. So, so I have to stand up here and give you what thus saith the Lord. I, like the old preacher used to say, I have to preach in season and out of season. I have to preach when I'm up and when I'm down. You know what I mean? I had to get that out of my system because no preaching is going on today. And, and, and nobody cares about my life. But can I talk about my life? I think transparency is important because I think part of the challenge is we've become super saints. We become mighty men and women of God. If you look at the Bible, there are people that were considered mighty men and women of God. They did mighty acts, but they also had not only a highs, they had depths of lows. They had nuanced experiences. They had moments where they asked God, are you with me? And uh, can I do this? And why has thou forsaken me? Uh, there, there, there are some issues. There are some nuanced experiences. There are some real folks in the Bible. And the challenge that I have with most of us is we won't even be as real as the people in the Bible. This year, I, I said, babe, uh, uh, I got about one more Sunday in me, uh, and then I need to do a sabbatical. I, and I'm still, every Sunday, I've been, for the last month, I've been saying, I'm going to get that sabbatical in. And she's like, no, you got it. And after a while, I'm, you know, I'm like, no, I don't have this. I I'm anointed, but I'm frail. I, I, I have a call on my life, but I'm human. I've had bold faith, and I've stepped out, and God has done the miraculous in our lives. But there are times where, where I, I question whether he'll do it again. There are times where there's an overwhelming sense of the presence of God that comes over me. But there are times when uh, i got to encourage you that God's with you. And I know he's with me. But it just doesn't always feel. Okay, no amens on this side. Let me try this one. It just doesn't always feel. I think I got the real folks in the center. This is the high school. It just doesn't always. Y'all feel me. Feel like it. Seasons in my life we go through, no matter how much we love him or have loved him, I found that there are times that my stomach is bigger than my eyes. <laughs> You've heard the statement, your eyes are bigger than your stomach. It means like you have an appetite for something that you don't even have the capacity to receive. But, but have you ever had that experience spiritually where your, 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 your appetite is not bigger than your capacity? But there's a deep-seated need. You know you need a fresh move of God. You know you need a fresh wind of God. You know you need more of him. But your eyes have, have you know, your appetite has, has just changed a bit. What, what, another subject for another time, because I don't have time to deal with both. But if uh, put a pin there. I promise you I'm going to come back and preach it uh, sometime in this quarter. But, but what do you do when you don't desire God as you should? What do you do when my, your need outweighs your desire? Wow. Uh, 
another time. Yet we all want a meaningful relationship with him. No one says, I want to have a partially fulfilling walk. Right. Who woke up and said that? Nobody in this place says, I, I want somewhat of an experiential move of God. You know, give, me, give me a lukewarm move today. No, nobody says that. Nobody says, I want the melancholy anointing. No. <laughs> Nobody says, I want the seasonal relationship with God, sometimes on, sometimes off. All of us, deep down inside of us, want the whole thing. But the reality is, some people in this place have become frustrated. Now, I wish I had time to work this like I don't. I wish this was a retreat, because I would work this uh, like a chicken wing until there was no more meat left on the bone. I'll crack the bone open and suck the marrow out, if this will retreat. I only have a few minutes with you, but... But, but, but I would say that the Holy Spirit shifted me in this message today. This wasn't even what I was going to talk about. I was going to go back and revisit how to hear accurately the voice of God, then have the faith level to respond to hearing, to the, hearing the voice of God so that supernatural things will begin to manifest through your life. That's what I came prepared for. But at 11 p.m., God says, there are some people in this place that are not prepared to hear anything or to learn how to hear from me. There are some people that are so frustrated in their walk right now because there is a sense of the withdrawal of my presence, the withdrawal of my attributes. They, they don't even feel like they're, I'm vibing with them like that. They, 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 they will listen to you and nod their heads if you start talking about how to hear God speak. But the reality is they're too frustrated to listen if I did speak. There's some people in this place that are burnt out in their walk with me. They're burnt out because they don't feel. They have not been experiencing what they've experienced at one point in time in their journey with me. They're frustrated. And until you deal with the frustration, let's not get to the supernatural. Until we deal with the frustration, let's not get to the mighty moves and the outpourings and the manifestations and what the. He said there are some frustrated people that have got to get beyond their frustration and understand why they're frustrated and what I'm up to before they can get into why how, how I speak. Frustrated. In your walk, God love him, but frustrated. It's almost like you don't even have the tools. I don't know who I'm talking to, but there's some folks in here you don't even have. You, you feel like you don't even have. The stuff you've been doing in years past to bring you into a more intimate place with God, it doesn't even seem like it's working. It's not that it's not valuable. It's not that there's not, there's not a place for it. But you, truth be told, you won't tell your Sunday school this. You won't tell your connect group this. Maybe you will, your connect group. But you're not going to turn to your neighbor and tell them this. The tools I've been using don't seem to produce the results that I've had in years past. And it doesn't even seem like God's helping me with this one. There's unspoken frustration. I know I used to be the first one to employ my gift. I know I used to be the first one to sign up for, for ministry excursions. I know I used to be the first one to share my testimony. I know I used to be the first one to minister and encourage somebody else, but I'm just not there right now. And I've done a good job of hiding that reality, but I moved past hiding. People can see it on my face now. I got to look like, don't even come and talk to me with that. Keep it pushing. Yeah, I, I know you haven't seen me at church, Pastor, but it had nothing to do with you. Nothing to do with the praise team. And then you can do better. That's not why I'm tripping. But I'm frustrated. But God, frustrated with my walk. That's why in ministry, never get frustrated at people's frustration or never take people's frustration personally. It's not about you half the time. Amen. You're the closest thing on earth to a representative of God, and when they're frustrated with God, they walk away from you. Yes. But can we be real? Yes. Frustrated folks. Sometimes, can I tell you before you leave, before you throw in the towel, before you Decide just where you are. You're just going to do you. <laughs> Can I tell you the statement right before the backslide? <laughs> I'm just doing 
Oh, God, I know what's that word. I don't even have to be prophetic to tell you what's next. I can't tell, I have to be prophetic to tell you decline's coming. I don't even have to be prophetic to tell you that, that, that you're getting ready to step back in the things that God brought you out of. I, I, I can't, you, you're venting. That is the subtle, passive-aggressive rebellion. I'm just... Can I tell you why some of you are do, getting ready to do you? You're getting ready to do you because you're frustrated with where you are with God. Hear me. God sent me in a place for one message. To tell you that you've misread the sense of God's withdrawal. You, you, you've misdiagnosed your case. And you do all kind of crazy things when you're misdiagnosed. I wish I had time. I, I had a friend uh, whose sister was misdiagnosed with HIV while I was in college. And that's before they had good medication. Misdiagnosed. And she went into a destructive behavioral pattern. She began to use all kinds of drugs. She put herself in harm's way and began to do things that killed, were, gonna, were killing her because she thought that she was dying already. Can I tell you that there are people in this place that you're, do, you're doing unhealthy things. You're moving into unhealthy patterns because you've been misdiagnosed. You've misdiagnosed your case. You think that you're dying because you're misreading God's sense of withdrawal. But listen, you, you've misdiagnosed your case and you're putting yourself in be, uh, destructive behavioral patterns because you're reading the signs the wrong way. Can I help you? Sometimes we misread the sense of God's withdrawal. It is never to cause disappointment with him, but it's rather it's to cause a depth of hunger. Write that down, depth of hunger. He's not trying to kill you. He's not trying to frustrate you. He's not trying to get you upset. He's not trying to get you to backslide. He is trying to build hunger. And we have misread a sense of his withdrawal. Listen to me. There's a promised reality in this passage that's hinged on a contingency. He says, you will find me. You will be restored again to the joy of this relationship. I don't know who I'm talking to, but that's somebody's word. Don't mess up. Don't give up. Don't backslide. Don't do you yet. And here's why I don't want you to just go do you yet. Because he says, listen to me, you will find me again. The relationship will be restored again. I, I'm, I'm, I will put the pieces back together again. And it's something about God, when he puts the pieces back together, he makes the wait worth it. I wish I, I don't know who I'm talking to. You've been waiting, you've been praying, you've been frustrated. But God, when he shows up and puts it back together again, he always gives you some extras. He doesn't just give you a banana split, but he puts whipped cream Cherry, I, I, peanuts, and a cherry on top. God, I wish I touched. Look at somebody tell me, you better hang in there. You better, you, you better not give up. You better stay where you are. You better keep your butt right there. Look at them like you have some backbone. Some weight I say wait on. I'm trying to talk, y'all. Make me preach a little. Try, I'm trying to. There's a promised reality hinged on a contingency. Listen to me. He said, you will you're going to find me. So you, listen, listen to me. He says that th this relationship, this, this, this thing is going to be restored. He says, but it comes with a, the restoration is hinged on a contingency. Here's the contingency. <laughs> he said, you're going to find me. Oh, you're going to find me. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. He does not say, oh, I'm going to come visit you. See, the church has made it. Everything is, God, you sit where you are. You don't do anything. You don't employ anything. You lay there in the bed every time. And God always going to show up and show out. God said there are times, listen to me, and here's where you misdiagnosed it. He says, I'm over here, you're over there. Not in my presence, but just with a sense of my presence. He says, and I'll leave it here for a while. We're going to find each other. You're going to find me. 
when you look at that active. You. So, you, 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 oh, oh, you want to just be, you just want to walk into the house of God and be transformed every week? To be lifted out of where you are? You want a prophetic word of inspiration to come to you as you lay at bedside Baptist? You, just, you just want the anointing of God to fall every time? Some of you just want to wake up in the, God, why don't I just, why? Why don't I just wake up in the glory every day? He said, oh, yes, yeah, sometimes that's how it works. Sometimes um, you will find, you won't find me when you look, when you search. <sighs> that time. Somebody said, that's the Old Testament. That, that's the, to the cover of the people of Israel. God is with us at all times. Uh, I hear what the Lord says to the church. Revelation. In other words, you know what Revelation is? That's all the way at the end. End. New Testament end. 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 He says, he says, he says, ask, I mean, uh, 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 seek, shall find, not ask, wait, what is it, Carlos? You know, you know every scripture, you memorize the Pentateuch. Ask, yes. Yes, not Seek you find, knock and the door shall be opened to you. Thank you. Edit that out later. <laughs> then he concludes that statement. Listen to what he says. He says, hear what the Lord says to Israel. No. To the church. Are you with me? Now, so at the end of the age, he's still saying, Ask, seek, knock. In other words, you do something. You'll find me when, when, when you search for me, listen to me. How do you want me to search for you, God? Notice this. And this is somebody's word today. I came just on assignment to tell you this. You've been complacently waiting for God to drop this in your lap. You've been waiting to hear the right message to inspire you into your new place in God. You've been waiting for your miracle blessing that everybody's told you is on the way. And you just jump up, spin around three times, and Shabbat the Lord. But listen to me. God says certain things will only be released and restored when you seek me. Now, how does he tell us to seek him? He says, if you seek me with all of your, God convicted me, he jacked me up. I said, God, I want the glory every day. I want to wake up. I want to wake up and just, I want to slay my whole family in the spirit. Just because I got up at breakfast, as they're eating oatmeal, Lord, just touch them. And I want them, I want them out. I want that kind of glory. We're missing school. Are you with me? I just want that glory. I said, I want to wake up in that. And God said, uh, uh. Yeah, you've been putting this on me, brother. He said, have you sought me? Now, I know you guys are more spiritual than me. But have you sought me with? God, I wish I had time. With your whole? I mean, really? You mad at me? Mad at the church. I, mean, I want any. I want them to go another level. When are they gonna raise the dead? <laughs> When's the last time you? Come on, come on. Let's take an evaluate. You are you evaluating the ministry? Let me evaluate you, boo boo. <laughs> Let's look at your walk with God. Have you? Not talking about the pastor. Yeah. Not talking about the praise team. Yeah. Was it anointed today or not? Nah. <laughs> I give them a seven for execution. <laughs> how, how, how about this? What do you give yourself yeah. for execution? Yeah. Have you sought him? Yeah. I know we want the results of it. I do too. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, this not, I'm not blaming you. I'm telling you out of my, fr my own frustration, my, my own desire to go deeper, out of my own desires some days to say whatever. I don't need to go deeper. Oh, you guys don't ever talk to God like that, huh? 
You've never been so frustrated. It's never been so long that you just begin to say, you know what, I, I can function. I, it's, it's all right. Uh, you know, God, I'm, I'm going to try to make this work to the best of my ability because what I'm doing doesn't seem to be working. You've never been there. You've never done that. You've never said that. But I, so I, I'll be transparent for all y'all. I've been there. I said it. And it's not a 20-year-ago testimony. This year. He says, you want that shift? He, yesterday in the shower, le- last night in the shower, 11 p.m. He says, you seek with me with all your heart. Now here becomes the question. How do you seek God with all? <laughs> See, isn't it funny how those abstract, ambiguous statements are made? Love the Lord thy God, all your heart, mind, and strength. Right? It's like, okay, that's great, but it's up to each one of us on what all of our heart, mind, and strength looks like. Because there's everyone in this place raise your hands. Yep, yep, I've been doing it all my heart, mind, and strength. <laughs> but what does it look like? I said, God, what is a contemporary example of what it looks like to search for you for this season that I don't feel your presence, that I don't feel this manifest? sense of your, 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 your accompaniment or your benefits or, or your favor or, or your anointing. What does it look like to seek you with all my heart? How, how can I make it plain? What does it feel like? What is, it, what, 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 what is the life-altering pursuit of God like? Last night, 11 o'clock p.m., in the shower, God said, the most passionate pursuit that you will ever have in this life would come from personal loss of presence. As a father, he said, if you lost a child, I'm not talking about to death, I'm talking about kidnapped. I don't mean to take you down. Stick with me. How would you Search for them. Oh, I guarantee you, it would not be half-hearted. God says, you, you want to search for me? You want this ch- thing to change. You want the, your, this dynamic to change. You want a sense of my manifest presence again. You want a sense of what you, what you had, and you want to exceed what you had. He says, listen, I, you, you can get it if you search for me. How, God, how do you want to search for you? Search for me with your whole heart. Search for me like I was your kidnapped child. How would you search, question, for your kidnapped child? Ah. It becomes consuming. God said, I want you to search for me in a way that you're consumed by your pursuit. Your child was kidnapped. Your mind would not rest. Your first thought, where's my baby? Your frequent thought, where's my baby? Your fixed thought, where is my baby? After a while, you'd have to function. You'd have to talk to other people. You'd have to do interviews. You'd have to even go work to work to keep food on the table. But even in the midst of your working, even in the midst of your interactions, in the midst of your interviews, there, there is something on the forefront of your mind. You have to do enough to function in normal society, but it changes the way that you view everything through the lenses of your missing child. God says, can you search for me like that where you still go to work? You're still having interactions, you're still talking to people, you're still keeping food on the table, but your number one pursuit is not just how you're going to ball out of control, but, but in this season, you don't put your money over me. In this season, you don't put your entertainment over me. In this season, you don't put your relationship over me. In this season, you are consumed with me. You're still interacting in those arenas, but your fixed thought, your foremost thought, your frequent thought is on your pursuit of restoring to me, God. Joy of your salvation. It would consume your mind. It would consume, listen to me, it would consume your emotion. Your child missing, you wouldn't be sitting watching a scandal marathon. (laughs) 
because you'll be preoccupied with your desire to find what you have lost. And some of us in this place need to take up our, take, listen, take inventory. If we say we're serious and we mean business, don't just sit there complacently and wait for God to bring it to you. But sometimes when you find yourself in this place, you've got to begin to go for after him with everything that is in you like you had a kidnapped child. I don't know who I'm talking to, but God says, you want that glory back? Come after me like a kidnapped child. Seek me with your mind. Seek me with your emotion. You Seek me with your body. If you had a kidnapped child, every free moment you had, you'd be walking the streets. You already walked this street. I'm going to walk this street again. Are you with me? You already prayed that prayer. I'm going to pray that prayer again. I'm going to walk the floors. It's not in the physical that something's lost, but it's in the spiritual that something's lost. And I'm going to put my prayer tread all over heaven. I'm going to beat on God's door. You've been there before, but I'm going to keep knocking. I'm going to keep seeking. I'm going to keep asking, how, how do you know when to stop? I'm going to stop when something changes. I'm going to stop when the atmosphere of my spirit changes. I'm going to stop when I get my hunger back. I'm going to stop when God tells me, that's enough. I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to pester you. I'm going to keep you up at night. I know that we're used to cool prayers, but desperate times call for desperate measures. And when I'm desperate, I don't do those cool prayers. I know people say, just pray once, God. Maybe God knows. Just decree and declare it. No, I'm going to decree, declare, pray, ask, seek, knock, yell, scream, whatever I got to do. I'm going after you. You don't know how much I miss this. Thing. The pursuit, listen, the pursuit changes. Ah, man, I didn't get to the good part. That's not the message. That's the intro. God, we're going in right here. Golly. You have to come to church now. It means two weeks in a row. We haven't gotten to the good part yet. I promise you. There's revelation that will change your life and expose to you the season that you're in next week. I did it all 8 o'clock service. Don't know how, but I did. Next week. Before we go, there's actually a member in our church, and you may have seen the story on CNN several years ago. God says, if you seek with me, search for me with all your heart. Search for me like I was a kidnapped child. One of the members of our church, one of our dear friends, was the one who helped break the case for the kidnapped J.C. Lee D- 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 uh, Duger. Remember that? They, they broke the case. This man had kidnapped her. Had come with these little girls that just looked strange. Reported him to the police, come to find out one uh, event happened, another event happened. They found this, this girl that had been kidnapped 18 years ago. I mean, I, I know some of us in this place, some of us in this place, know what it is to seek God. Some even say, Pastor, I, I hear you. But, but, but I'm too frustrated for that right now. Because for every year that you don't get the expected results, it compounds the frustration and dissolves the resolve. There's some people that have been in this season, I don't know who I'm talking to for a month. Ah, there, there are others who have been in this season. You won't tell anybody this, but, but God sent me on assignment looking for you. You've been in this place for years. And you know too much about God to walk away from him altogether. 
Some of you in this place, you've been coming to church every week. You've learned how to go through the motions, but with your lips to honor him, but your, your heart's been disconnected a long time ago. Not disconnected because you're a bad person, not disconnected because you're sinful, not disconnected because, but disconnected because you're just, you're just, you're just tired. Tired of waiting. Tired of believing when it seems as if there's no promise of change. Tired of doing everything everybody told you to do, but it doesn't seem as if it's become more real. Tired of, of seeing others in your life. It seems like there's breakthrough and there's promise and there's favor and there's blessing on their life and they're walking with God. They're talking about how exciting their walk with God is, but it doesn't seem as if anything for you is shifting and, and now it's wearing on you. That's what the Bible says. Don't, don't become weary. Weary. Weariness implies that you've gone beyond the season of just human strength. There's certain things that you just brush off and just say, I'll deal with it. There's certain things that you just, you just push through. You just, you, and the challenge is now, you're, you're tough, you're strong, you're resilient, you're, you, but, but now you're in a place where, where you're just past, you're past enduring. You're past, you know, this, and you, you're, you're, you're frustrated. Could you imagine what it's like to have hope that your child be found, but then to have to live with uncertainty for 18 years. I, enough about the child. It's for somebody, for, for the relationship they walk with God, it's, it's for every day that's gone by, it's created more frustration. We can't always see it, but you're losing hope. You're losing your resolve. You're losing your internal spiritual fortitude. But God sent me into this place to tell you this thing is not over. He said, if you look for me. Now here's what he didn't tell us. He did not tell us how long we have to look for him before the change. God, can I talk to some real folks in here? Because, see, you've been thrown off because it looks like there are people that looked for him for five days and they got him. It looks like there's some people that looked for him for a few months and they got everything that they desired. They walk with him like never before. But you say, I've been doing this for a while. There's been a season, not just a season, but, but, but this is becoming my reality. I feel stuck feel frustrated. I can't tell anybody where I am. If I do, will they understand that I'm here? This is where I'm supposed to be strong. This is where I'm supposed to look like I have it together. But, I, but the reality is I'm, I'm on fumes. Yet after 18 years, God, what was that like? Question God sent me to ask you, can you hold on when there's delay? Because here's what my God will do. I love him. He will keep you alive. Sometimes, not just by the manifestation of everything you're looking for, but at the hope that is on the way. I thought about Job's life. He, he pushed him beyond his limits. He went beyond what he was able to endure. And I love Job. He gives this passage that actually reflects his life and his journey with God. He says, he speaks of life and he speaks of the hope, literally of a tree. He was fighting to even have the hope of a tree. And here's what he says. He says, at least there's hope after a long period of time. He says, at least there's hope for a tree. For if it is cut down, he says, it will sprout again and its new shoots will not fail. Now here's what he says, verse number eight. He says, its roots may grow old. In other words, it just hadn't had water in a long time. It's been waiting to be refreshed for a long time. It said, its roots may grow old old. His roots may go old in the ground and its stumps may die dead. That's how long it's been since it had a fresh dose of water. But it says and its stumps may die in the soil yet. Look at your neighbor tell him yet. It says at the scent of water. At the scent of 
water, it will bud and put forth shoots like like a. Now, it didn't say when it gets water. It said at the scent of water. They heard that water. They didn't know when it was coming. They didn't know where it was coming from. But they heard that water was, they didn't have it yet. Their bank account hadn't changed. They weren't overwhelmed after the church service by the scent of the glory. But they heard somewhere that God is a God no matter how long you have to wait. That God is a God that will come. I didn't come to talk to everybody. I came to talk to some people whose roots are dead. I came to talk to some people whose hope has been cut down, whose relationship has been cut down, whose walk with God, you feel as if you're a stump with dead roots. But I love my God because my God says at the promise of water, new life, God, I feel it. New life starts to, and I came to promise somebody, I don't know when it's coming, I don't know how it's coming, but fresh water, fresh water, fresh life, fresh water is on the way. Look at somebody, somebody, I know you feel like giving up. I know you feel like doing you, but God says, if you don't become weary and well-doing, you receive a harvest if you faint not. Touch me because the water's on the way. 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 Fresh life on the way. Fresh in the way. Your chain is on the way. Weakness may endure for a night, but joy, 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 coming in the morning. God, I speak in this place. I speak in this way. Fresh life. 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 Fresh life to your people who have been weary, who have been worn, whose faith feels dead, whose hope feels lost. Lord, I speak new life. I pray that like the tree that has become a stump with dead roots, as you send fresh water, I gotta go, but can I tell you real quick? In the Bible, what water is? Water represents the word of God. Ephesians, when it talks about husbands and wives, is that you wash her with the water of the word of God. Can I tell somebody in this place that has not heard his voice, that has not felt his presence, that there's fresh water on the way. I'm not just talking about another memorized Bible verse, but I'm talking about when the Holy Spirit brings that Bible verse to life. I'm talking about when the Holy Spirit gives prophetic insight. You're a word away from transition. You're a word away from change. You're a word away from being refreshed. This is the same passage where the Lord says, I know the plans that I have for you. And these plans that I have for you are not to harm you, but to prosper you and give you hope and a future. I can't reach everybody. I can't touch everybody. But if I could, I would grab them by both hands and tell them that God still has some plans for you. Grab somebody. Matter of fact, prophesy to somebody that God still has some plans for you. You shall not die, but you shall live. I see life over you in the name of Jesus.